Okay. okay, so we're gonna we're gonna jump a little bit um, because of time. It, it's actually more important that um, we cover stuff that you taste it, you can actually absorb stuff. I know you've been getting all this coming at you all of a sudden. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna jump over. We're gonna finish off a little bit of this section, and then we're gonna actually skip the fourth one and go directly to the fifth. Um, so uh, homework for you guys, which is fun homework. Um, you should look for how buildings learn. There's a video series on YouTube. Originally was done for the BBC. And uh, this is the core idea that comes out of it. And it's been um, uh, one of the th themes that's coming from the Long Now Foundation, where Stuart Brand is doing work on pacing layers. And so when I was talking to you about processes and structure, this is a way of looking at buildings in terms of process change over time. So the pacing layers model says what you do is you start off with a site. The building site is the slowest changing layer. And so site is eternal, and you don't really change your site very often. Next to site, you have structure. You put up the load-bearing walls. After that, you put up the skin, which is the protection of the load-bearing walls outside. Inside, you put in the services. So inside the load-bearing walls, you put in um, the plumbing, the electrical, the venting. Cattle. Cattle. <laughs> So in boiling water. Uh, okay. Uh, you put in the services. Uh, then you put in the space plan, which is the non-load bearing walls. And after that, you put in the stuff, which is all the furniture. And so the idea here is that when you are looking at systems, and you're looking at systems, you look at them in a certain time and the layer you're looking at. Uh, this is uh, you, you, so you have as an example, if you're going to do renovation. Uh, easy renovation, the, the easiest thing to do is just move furniture. That doesn't require moving any walls. Okay? Uh, if you are going to do a renovation, the next thing is, okay, let's just do the non-load bearing walls. I just want to go through and put a door there. There's nothing stopping us. When you get to the point where you start getting into the services, it's like, well, actually, there's a, uh, a conduit, a duct behind that wall. You start getting more complicated. So the way you think about this is, and the pacing layers is actually um, what Tim Ingold does in the supply side sustainability stuff, which is um, you have constraints above and your constraints below. So you have fast changing layers and slow changing layers. In a, a later book that Stuart Brand in the Clock of Law Now, he writes that fast gets all the attention, slow has all the power. Fast gets all the attention, slow has all the power. So if you're trying to change the system, when you're changing the system, you might want to aim for the lower, the slower changing parts because they're more durable. So let's go back to transportation as an example. So we're talking about the TTC. What would happen if the TTC collapsed? Oh, besides everyone walking. Well, if the TTC collapsed, what could actually happen was um, there's two directions you could go. One is you could go to a faster changing lane, which is taxis and Uber. So without TTC, you could actually go and we would do everything with Uber and do everything with taxis. Uh, and it's good to a point. The problem you run into is those are not very durable um, types of, of modes of transportation. If you're not going to get very well, they just can't move a lot of people in rush hour, just too crowded. That's a faster and smaller system. What's the bigger and slower system? Well, you can actually do a go train. You can take a go train and you can go one stop from Union Station to Main Station. Now, that doesn't have many stops in between, right? That's like, yes, but it's better than walking to Main. You have to walk to Main to take you all day. So there's a slower system, which is a train system in the province of Ontario. And so when you collapse, you can collapse down or you can collapse up. It's an interesting way of thinking about it. If a system stopped to exist, there'd be another system behind it. It may not work as well, or, but it would work. But when you are changing a system and you're trying to intervene in a mess and start looking at it, you've got these interlocking things between it. You, you may have a load-bearing wall and you go, I want to change that load-bearing wall and it's going to take a while. <laughs> because it's a lot of work. It's not just like moving furniture. 
but it's going to last. Or you could just say, nah, I'll make it easy. So a simple example of, uh, of this would be uh, a closet versus an armoire. A closet is part of the space plan. An armoire is part of the stuff. When you leave your apartment and you move somewhere else, you cannot take the closet with you. You can take the armoire with you. There's actually a model. Um, this goes back into uh, what actually became the uh, mass customization model. That's helpful. People haven't thought about it. Is that if you think about, um, and this is in terms of companies, if you think about product change, it's your process change. So you can start off with stable and stable. So uh, well, actually, you can start off you know, start off at the top. Typically, what happens is you have an invention, which is a dynamic product and a dynamic process. Every time you invent something, it is new, so it's a new product, and every time you create it, it's a new way of doing it. You have mass production, which is a stable product and a stable process, and what you can do there is do the same thing over and over again. So this is the Model T um, by Ford, any color as long as it's black. You can do a process change, have a stable product, but have a dynamic change and get continuous improvement. So now we'll start painting cars in different colors and you know have a few variations on them. But there's this question as to whether you get to the other state, which is to have a stable process and a dynamic product and have mass customization. So it's actually possible to have a stable process and a dynamic product. Now what that means is that every time you create something, it's different but it's done in the same way. Uh, the original case for uh, studying this used to be Panasonic bicycles. Um, they would actually custom build a bike for you, like you would put, it, put the measurements online and they would do it for you. And uh, this is way back in the 1980s uh, when they did that. And so people didn't believe that you could actually get a bike done that fast. It would only take them less than a day to build a bike because you stop thinking about it. all you're doing is, is welding together some parts. And so what they actually would do was they would actually uh, build the bike in the store for four days and ship it after that, because people wouldn't believe you could do it that fast. There's a wrong way of doing it, which is to try to go from mass production to mass customization. Uh, you can't actually do that, because you're trying to change, you, you have, you're, you're, you're trying to change from a stable product into a dynamic product. The path that you actually take is you come from invention down through mass production, so you stabilize, you do continuous improvement and do a process transformation, and then you might be able to make it a mass customization. So people that are starting up with mass customization companies, they typically are not really mass customization companies. They're typically invention companies that they're doing, you know, they're flying by the seat of their pants, they stabilize, and then, um, they, they get into a stable mode, and then they try to expand it through that. But a lot of the issues come when they start changing processes. So we covered, uh, we actually didn't cover the innovation theory for a lot of time. Uh, I'll be putting up a video of the book launch which covers actually some of the stuff in my book, so you can look out for that at worldwide.com. Uh, we did cover the social psychological, social technical, social psychological systems, causal textures we covered, pacing layer change we covered, and we did the product process change. So we're going to skip now, because we had interest in services, we're going to skip over the next section all the way down to number five find it. And even then we'll skip a lot of that. Uh, okay, industrial value change versus co-producing offerings. So there's um, there's a philosophical change that happens, and the issue is whether you look at quality in the thing versus quality in the interaction. Um, and this will lead us towards thinking about affordances. Um, there's uh, a theory of the offering that's helpful, um, that is a systems-based approach to services. We'll talk a little bit about production systems versus service systems, and we'll talk about affordance languages, and we'll finish off with the idea of adaptive versus generative. So, the ecological shift, and this is the philosophical shift I've made, um, there's an ecological um, 
ecological anthropology, ecological epistemology, and the question is, well, what is this thing? And um, and I try and work through the history. I now realize what was happening in the 1960s, 1970s when this research came out. Originally, the idea, of the, the research in psychology was behavioral psychology, which is like Pavlov's dog. You ring the bell, the dog salivates, right? And what you're trying to do is understand what's happening inside the head of the dog. You're not understanding, you, 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 you've got the response from the environment, you have a system changing. Um, J.J. Gibson uh, brought up this, a different idea, which is, okay, let's try to understand how aircraft land on a Navy carrier. Because the aircraft is having to adjust, the landing strip is moving, because you're on the ocean. And what can we do to help us understand that? And unfortunately, behavioral psychology doesn't help you. It really doesn't help you because um, the idea of stimulus response is, oh, I see, I see the, uh, the um, landing strip, and then I respond. I see the landing strip, I respond. I see the landing strip, I respond. You can't do it that way because you're actually working on both things simultaneously. So this, this leads into, um, Gibson is one of the foundations on which the um, uh, idea of corresponding comes out. In effect, you want a corresponding between the pilot and the aircraft carrier that's happening through the aircraft. So the question I have is, is thinking across agricultural systems, industrial systems, and service systems all the same? And the premises behind these are really different. Agricultural systems work off the clock. They work, they work off natural systems. They work off the sun. Uh, they work off the seasons of the year. Industrial systems work on machine time. Um, and service systems, well, I don't know. So agricultural systems, imagine you're at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And so I go to Peter's place, and Peter's been on this farm. And Peter uh, is having a tough year, and I say, look, Peter, I have an industrial factory. I come, come in and uh, I'll, I'll give you a job. You come in and uh, it, we're heated in the winter, we're air conditioned in the summer, you work nine to five, you get steady paid. How's that sound? He says, oh, that sounds pretty good. I say, okay, we start nine o'clock Monday. And Peter says, you mean sunrise? No. No. No, we work nine to five. Bob, well, have a watch. Probably do now, but hit that air up. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. need one if you're an ag if you're an ag and an ag. Yeah, if if you were, if you're coming in from an agricultural system, in the winter you don't work. You work really short hours because if you're working in an industrial system, you go to work in the dark and you come home in the dark. Okay, so the rhythms there are different. In service systems, we now work with computers and we work with mobile telephones. And working nine to five doesn't make any sense. Why should it make sense? Like you work when you when your phone rings, you work when your computer's <laughs> up. When the internet goes down, you go for movies. So th there's a different logic that happens in these type of systems. Service systems, and it's easiest to come to service systems and describe them in terms of what um, Jim Sporer was asked. Well, what would a high what would a school program look at the primary level? And so he said, these are the type of service systems we have in the world. The first set are systems that move, store, harvest, and process. So I've been talking about transportation systems. In kindergarten, getting your kid to school, they all learn about cars, they learn about buses, you may walk, you may bike, they learn about transportation systems, it's a simple one. You learn about water and waste management, that is a service system. Food and global supply chain, something you could learn at, at grade two. Food just doesn't happen in, uh, in a supermarket, you can go to a farm. Energy and energy grid. Power doesn't happen just by plugging into the wall. You can go actually look at a, a uh, power plant. And then by grade four, information, communications, infrastructure. So you could actually now be discussing, well, you know, how is it that phone actually works? Because you can talk to people at least by magic. The second set of systems are systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building construction is actually a service industry much more than it is a product. Uh, banking and finance, obviously service industry people know well. Retail and hospitality is major, healthcare and education. These are all things that get more and more abstract as we go along. When you get to grade nine, uh, grade 10, uh, you start studying civics, which is a good time to do it because government is really an abstract thing. It's a service system. 
Uh, when you get to the region state provincial level, it's more abstract, and by the time you get to a federal level, it's super abstract. So these are all service systems you can learn about. Uh, there's been a definition of service systems, um, which you can look up. This oh. is the Institute of Manufacturing. But a service system is a dynamic configuration of resources. The resources are people, technology, and organization shared information. The service system creates and delivers value. The value is through service. It's between a provider and a customer. It can be a complex system, a complex system of interactions, interaction to provider, customer, 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 supplier, supplier. So there are systems ways of looking at it. Now, the theory of the offering, Rafael Ramirez, and this is in um, history, Rafael Ramirez was a, uh, a uh, student in, the, in, in Russ Acoff's program um, at the University of Pennsylvania. And then he actually um, was a grad student at York University when Eric Trist was there, the guy that did the turbulent environment stuff. So you have this long tradition. And so uh, Rafael is not the most obvious system thinker, uh, he's really well known for being the scenarios guy. He runs the Oxford Futures Forum. Um, and I asked him one day, do you ever use system thinking in your work? And he says, all the time. And I said, how is that? And he says, scenario planning should be a Singarian inquiring system, the fifth way of knowing. And he said, David, you're the only person I can tell that to because you know what a Singarian inquiring system is. So or did if you, you do get to that in the talk? Then yes. Yeah. We did it. They don't understand it, but they will now. They'll pay attention. <laughs> because when you are designing the scenarios, the scenarios are not just random. They are actually poles. You have to think black and white. Two-dimensional black and whites. And multi-dimensional. So uh, theory of the offer came from Richard Norman, who's one of the people that you worked with. And there's two ways of approaching services. Um, if you are doing any recent work on services, you'll see the term service dominant logic, which is one of two ways of doing it. Um, Steve Vargo, um, I, I met, I had him come to a service science, services and science conference in Tokyo, and I asked him, um, Steve, have you read Vargo? I, I read Norman Ramirez, he said, of course. And so I said, well, why do you do service dominant logic? He says, there's two ways of approaching service. One is to create a new vocabulary that's really clear, but no one knows what it is, mm -hmm. and you have to redefine everything. The other one is to use the same words and then say what I mean. And so in the case of Raphael Ramirez and, and uh, Richard Norman, offering is a new term, and they define it. What happens when you do a service on logic, the first question is, what do you mean by service? Do you mean this means service, consumers or that? Not? And so it gets confusing. So working on service systems, I found theory of the offering much clearer. So in the theory of the offering, there's three dimensions associated with it. An offering has physical content, has service content, and people content. So if you talk about an automobile, there's a physical automobile, there's a service content, which would be uh, financing as an example, and then the people content would be um, maintenance or the relationship you have with the dealer. And there's different ways of approaching it, and now you get into the systems part of it, which is, is the offering part of the input or part of the output and how the transaction done. So there's an industrial logic, which is the offering as an output and customer value through a transaction. Traditionally, when you're looking at automobiles, this is the way it works. You buy a car, after you bought the car, it's your problem. The offering came, which was the vehicle. The customer value through the transaction, you own the car, you can do whatever you want with it. That's where the value is. There is a customer value through relationship, which is a service logic, which is based on customer satisfaction. If you lease a car, if you lease a car, you get the offering as output, you still get the vehicle, but you get the customer value through the relationship. It's a long-term thing. You can't walk away from the lease. It's a different proposition. There is the offering as input. So suppose that someone, uh, if you want to go stay with the automobile example, you could talk about a car kit. You can actually buy car kits and assemble your own car. I don't think cheaper, probably not. But you could buy all the parts, or you could buy multiple vehicles if you're into, into um, going into wrecking yards and stuff like that. You can assemble your own vehicle. But then the offering is input into your processes. The last category is a customer value through relationship. We have partnership logic. Now we have offering as inputs, and, um, and you have a long-term relationship, so this is where joint ventures come in. 
If you're doing research, you come together with all of your tools. Can you define what the output's going to be? No, you're actually focused on the inputs. Uh, yeah. find, uh, find a place to start wrapping this, yeah. wrapping up, and yeah. then take any questions for this. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. We'll need the save uh, last part of the, the class for, for working groups. Yeah. And we'll invite you to stay as well to circulate mm -hmm. and uh, advise or answer any questions in the group. <coughs> Okay, so when we're dealing with the interactions as opposed to dealing with the products, um, affordances are a helpful description. And this is J.J. Gibson again coming through. Um, an affordance, uh, the, the usual affordance we talk about would be a doorknob affords you the ability to open a door. Now, there's a little confusion here if you actually read Don Norman's work, because when he was at Apple, he first started working on affordances. And he didn't like the definition that um, that uh, J.D. Gibson had because he was in a different philosophy. For him, Don, for Don Norman, he has what's called a real affordance and perceived affordance, which is really dumb. Because then what he's saying is the doorknob is the affordance. In the original description by Gibson, the doorknob is not the affordance. It's the interaction between you and the doorknob. So if the doorknob exists and you don't know what the doorknob does, it's not an affordance. But this would mean that if you're on a Macintosh and there's a trash can and you don't know what the trash can means, then there's no way, it doesn't afford you the ability to delete it. No, that's why Don is trying to develop a affordance kind of language yep. in software so that you could start to understand how semiotics or, or symbolism could be used in software interaction, which is helpful because software is not a natural affordance in the first <coughs> place. So somebody had to start extending that. Yeah. I actually tried to, to do to, to do that type of extension in, in the late 1990s. And I, and I couldn't resolve, I didn't have the type of arrogance that, that Don has to try to make it stick. And that is, in other words, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, develop a solid of enough approach to define something like a, um, a symbolic affordances or social affordances, which we sometimes also talk about. But, but I think it's, it's expanded to, to social and symbolic affordances for the semiotics that Don Norman talks about. I mean, it's, it's not precisely, I mean, it's not the natural um, environment affordance in ecological psychology, but then they're not ecological psychologists. Yeah. That but, resonates but, with some of what, because I come from communications and the interpretation of affordance there is really about um, the things ability to communicate to whoever is around what its purpose or meaning is. So it may not be an object, even it might be an idea. Yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. And if you belong to a certain culture, then certain communication modes and representations can be well understood in the culture and to the point where you wouldn't even know to explain it to somebody who's from outside the culture. It would be part of the environment. So mm -hmm. social affordances are those that are understood mm -hmm. by you know, society or you know, within the culture. Yeah. It's helpful to be able to at least articulate this. Yeah. But you know, that's so, so the example I have here is when you're doing design, it's possible to design affordances for someone that's, that's high ability and someone that's low ability. So um, as an example right now, just walking around this building with the, this cane. Mm. Um, so I'm actually now a low ability person. I used to be a high ability person. Now I'm a low ability person. So when I des what, is the building designed for low ability people? And it's a choice. Now you can get into the complicated and complex, right? It, it, the, the complicated way is that two entrances. The complex way is that one entrance that works for everybody. Um, and we have a question about pattern language when I'm skipping over it. Uh, the work I'm doing on pattern language is to change the form to affordances. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, a philosophical change. And so um, the uh, blog post I just put up um, uh, on .com was a, a transcription of, uh, of the 90 minute workshop I had where I had, uh, so A Pattern Language was a book that was written by, uh, credited to Christopher Alexander, it's actually a team, mm -hmm. in 1977 architecture on how to, uh, how to design uh, buildings, towns, and construction. Um, and uh, one of the authors of that, co-authors of that, is Max Jacobson, who's now retired. This is how old these guys are. Uh, and I've been seeing at conferences, and so I got on a workshop, 
and I did uh, the talk about um, uh, course riddle, and Max comes back and says, pattern language is not for wicked problems. It has to be a tame problem to do pattern language. But what I've been doing is I want to use pattern language for wicked problems, which means I need to adjust a lot in the philosophy underneath. So that's what I've been working on for the past three years. Primarily, it's a pattern language based on affordances, which is why I'm talking about affordance language. Okay. So just, just to close this off, I was talking to you about equilibrium before. Um, systems that are in equilibrium, the only true equilibrium is death. <laughs> And so this is a really old uh, one I dug out, that stable equilibrium is death. So when you're talking about stable states, you might not want to be in that stable state. <laughs> if you're not in the state of death, then you need to be in a state um, where, it's w where the, the forces are all working in the right direction, right? Um, so there's, there's an idea that came out from, um, um, from Gould about um, punctuated equilibrium, which in effect is multiple stable states over time. Um, that's how system theory has changed. So just to close off, um, this, is a, this is a slide I used to close on the, on the talk. Um, we were talking, I, I was focused on innovation in the book that I'm working on. So my question was about uh, the system, or the theory building system we're doing, generative, and the difference between systematic and systemic. And so if you're looking at um, systemic, uh, if you look at, so it's possible to, to have adaptive change, which is somatic change or cellular change, uh, versus a genotypic or generational change. The way that uh, biologists differentiate is if you are going, um, if you are born at altitude, like, there, it, you know, you can, you can actually, if, if, uh, if you go from here to Denver and you're not used to being at altitude, it takes a couple of days to adjust, you can adjust. But that is somatic change, that's not a genotypic change. If you were born at a high altitude and you're born in Denver, then your biology is different. Uh, there's a difference between non-living and effect producing. There's, there's uh, in the literature, you might have run across the idea of autopoiesis. Autopoiesis is opposed to allopoiesis or allopoetic. So autopoetic systems are living and they, they are systems generating systems. Allopoietic systems are like factory lines. And so they produce something, but they don't produce themselves. So why would you do this? Well, it turns out, if you want to stop and think about it, that a lot of the autopoietic systems are complex systems. The allopoietic systems tend to be complicated systems. Okay. Uh, finally, a, a systemic approach is co-responsive because you've got multiple whole holes interoperating with each other, whereas if you have a systematic system, you may have a, a set of responses that doesn't learn. It learns a set of responses, and then that's kind of the catalog of that. So that's it for today. Okay, thank you. Can I take any questions or responses? Is there anything that came up during the discussion? Let them digest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just wondering with your work on designing affordances, do you think of this in terms of building in or baking in flexibility, adaptability into the yeah. pattern? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and so so Christopher Alexander was doing like the great article called "Systems Generating Systems" that he published, but he didn't go far enough. So that was really really. No, I show I showed the the cover picture from that in one of my talks mm -hmm. from System Act from 1969. Yeah, which is about the two systems of the kit of parts versus whole systems. Yeah, and so yeah, that was that was probably just last week uh -huh. actually. So yeah, it was a cool image because of how antiquated. It looks, and yet it's still, you know, it's still a compelling notion. Yeah, so it's from like 1969. The systems generating systems, as you describe. And then, just I, mean, I guess this is a bit of an existential question, but if you're, you know, if we're talking about systems generating systems and self-generating systems, 
Um, what do you make of the effort in, you know, AI and robotics where they're working on systems that can generate systems? And is that a sign, like, how, how do you treat that in relationship to living systems versus mechanical systems? Are they hybrid? What, how do you perceive We're, we're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that's actually current research. So, yeah. we're, 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 so uh, Susan Osel at Columbia University is scheduling. We'll, we'll actually find out at the end of this week whether it's going to happen or not, but Jim Spohr of my good research and, Raf and uh, Raphael Arar, are, we're going to meet us in Shanghai, mm -hmm. so, uh, and Wuhan, and so that's part of the conference that we do uh, with the uh, AI and this sort of thing. They, they don't have to work on pattern language and affordances. So. Mm -hmm. uh, the direction we're actually having, um, Susu and Raphael are both, uh, Raphael's become an um, editor for uh, Leonardo, I've never really known about, but I understand it's a prestigious arts journal. And so uh, we're actually moving past design into the arts to try to figure out some of the stuff around the system. Mm -hmm. And AI. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good question, though. I mean, if, are, is it that do uh, deep learning systems generate other learning systems in the way that we describe them, or would they really be equivalent to uh, autopoetic? Is mm -hmm. autopoetic also assumes that there's some continuity, <coughs> not that they're purposeful, but that the continuity uh, of, of um, you know, the, the continuity of like the genotype, so some so continuation. Of that. Well, what, what, so, one, of the, one of the clues so of Jim, Jim Sporer, Jim Sporer has been focused on the idea of <coughs> IA, intelligence augmentation, mm -hmm. and so it's definitely human-machine interaction, whereas most of the other technology companies have been focused much more on machine learning. So they don't care about human beings. Well, and then at some level, it's also about just simply your perception of whether that system is living or real or not. So if you look at some of the work on, um, uh, you know, whether AI systems have been able to trick people into yeah, thinking yeah. that they're human and, you know, this this notion of maybe it doesn't matter if they're human or not if we think they are. No, like the ELISA test. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It goes way back, but it's still... It's a limitation of, of up, it's a limitation of our understanding and our expectations as well. But the more, more interesting one is like um, chess, chess with the computer, like ch a human being and a computer playing another human being and a computer. That's the interesting combination. The machines playing each other, I don't find very interesting. Humans playing each other, we have already. So uh, it's a, but you know that really is intelligence augmentation. What we do with it. Uh, the meeting we had. A year ago, October, we ended up discussing about um, the idea that uh, that you would have a device that, in effect, records everything in your life. But it said, "Okay, then what is it like? It's actually like a seeing eye dog that you have in your device." But then they started discussing it's actually going to be like a, a litter of seeing eye dogs. So you have all these puppies, and the puppies are going to be fighting each other inside of your device. And so they're all trying to help you, but in different ways. And that's the sort of stuff we're discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, Semi-intelligent agents. Okay. Okay. So one of the things I want, uh, I want to have you take away from, from, from this talk and from, you know, and from all the preceding talks are the different frameworks that might uh, help in the synthesis map process. Because we're going from systems analysis to an integrated view of a complex system whether it's a social system, a service system, some of you are, are, are working from your, your P1 projects. So there's, I think, debt, uh, I think uh, debt based systems is continuing, and there's interest in affordable housing, and some of the others. Others are transforming, I think, air and water, right? So we'll want to talk about these. But as you start to, uh, we're actually you know, signaling a shift from decomposing and kind of breaking out and analyzing the components of the dynamics within a system to try to do more of, it's more of a Singarian inquiry at this point. It's an inquiring system of sweeping in, iterating at, in an abductive approach and not so much an analytic approach. So, there are, so we can take different frameworks and test them out to see if they apply in your problem. So that's one of the reasons, that's one of the things we want to do in the studios, as well as to see where you're going with your understanding of the problem areas that you're working on in the synthesis maps and through iterations. 
kind of sweep in different frameworks and see if they explain the, the patterns, behaviors, and, and outcomes. And they're, they're outcomes as well, so where some of your projects might take into account futures or foresight and not just the understanding of, of, of a systemic problem, but how that system might transform into different, in, into different future states. And so all of, all of these frameworks, like I think we've, I've, I've said before, um, in systems thinking, nothing is ever proven to be obsolete. It's only, there are only new models. So general systems theory is not like a theory that was disproven. And we don't use Bertolanffy's or um, GST or you know uh, kind of molding skeleton of science. Partly because, partly because of the the years that have gone by, not because that they are not valid or the types of problems that they're suitable for. You know these are we've kind of gone from very general frameworks to very specialized frameworks. And so some of the frameworks that that David has been kind of bringing forth both classical and newer, and plus the novel things that he's been working with are, are, are a way of thinking about you know, working across the different models, some of which may apply in your situations, and some may not. And so it would be, have you think about them and how those might apply as part of the, the application of systems thinking in these, in these complex problem areas. So, so should we? We'd like to break out in, in, into whatever groups you have, and Jeremy and I can, can, can circulate and